Um, I'm presenting today with my colleague, Lizzie Pelletier. Um, so I work at the Urban Institute. I'm a principal research associate at the Urban Institute in our Justice Policy Center. Um, Lizzie is a former colleague of mine who's now getting her PhD over in Washington. Um, so today we're gonna be talking again about forecasting. Um, before I get into that, I just wanna clarify or <laughs> really highlight the fact that Lizzie and I are not experts in forecasting. There are some people who build their entire careers around developing forecasting and simulation models. That was not Lizzie and I. Um, we're both researchers. Um, we do a lot of work around different types of methods and research and statistics, um, but we really had to learn how to do forecasting from scratch. Uh, we learned pretty early on that there's many, many ways to create a forecast, and so we had to kind of come up with our own process for the data that we had for the uses that we had intended. Um, so that's something that I'm gonna be highlighting kind of throughout this presentation is that um, it's important for you to be able to tailor your forecasting model to your uses, your goals, um, and your data. Um, so what we're gonna be doing today is kind of highlighting our journey in this process. Again, knowing that it's unique, may not be the same journey that everyone else would go through if you wanna, if you wanna um, dive into the world of forecasting, uh, but this is how we went about doing it. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about um, a, a forecasting model that Lizzie and I created called the Prison Population Forecaster. Um, it's an interactive tool that's available right now on Urban Institute's website. Um, so I'll give a quick introduction to that in a few slides and then Lizzie's gonna walk you through that at the end of the presentation to show you um, what we've done with forecasting and um, some of the tools that are out there right now. Um, so we'll, I'll, I'll describe that. I'm also gonna be using the Prison Population Forecaster or as we call it the PPF. I'm gonna be using that as an example throughout my presentation. So as I'm talking through kind of the inputs that go into a forecasting model, the key considerations, outcomes, et cetera, um, I'll be ref reflecting on the PPF throughout. So that's what we hope to do today, give you an overview of prison population forecasting first, talking about what it is, how it's used, and then we're gonna talk about some specific strategies for creating your own forecast. Okay, so to start with an overview, um, these are probably terms that you're all familiar with. I wanna say first too that I'm gonna, th there's many different terms that are used um, to describe forecasting or something like forecasting. As far as I'm aware, there's no set definition for each of these. Um, they're often used interchangeably. Um, from what I've seen in the literature, forecasting more often refers to kind of an average trend or an expected trend in the future based on um, kind of past trends. So for example, what's the most likely scenario five years from now or 10 years from now based on what's happening currently. Um, whereas simulation is more often used to refer to where you expect um, your prison population to change based on some sort of legislative change or policy change within the prison. Um, so in other words, forecasting is kind of an average, most likely scenario, whereas simulation is used to, to uh, estimate a very specific change in your population. Um, projection is also used similarly, I think, to simulation. Um, it's used to uh, talk about uh, what might happen in the future based on some sort of contingent criteria. So again, a policy change or statutory change. Um, and then in the fiscal uh, and financial literature, projection is often used to mean more long-term uh, estimates, whereas forecasting is more short-term estimates. So when they talk about forecasting uh, budgets, for example, they're usually talking about one or two quarters in the future, whereas when they're talking about projecting revenue or budgets, they're talking about several years in the future. Um, and I just wanna set the stage with that because this is, it's, it's interesting for us to know that um, they are used differently. But again, like I, as I said in the beginning, most of these terms are often used interchangeably. Um, we struggled with naming, uh, we, we're, we call our model the prison population forecaster. It went through many different names in the beginning. We were trying to figure out what fit the best for the data we had. We settled in on using the term forecaster because it just seemed to fit what we had um, better. It's kind of a, as you'll see when we talk about our model, it's kind of a straightforward, relatively simple model compared to some other models. We use aggregate, da aggregate data. We don't use kind of really complicated uh, microanalysis. Um, so we use the term forecaster, but again, uh, just highlighting here that there's many different ways uh, to talk about this kind of model. Um, we're, so today, throughout the presentation, I'm gonna be calling it forecasting, but just note that simulation, projection, um, those are all terms that are also used to refer to the same thing. Regardless of what it's called, there's many different uses of a forecasting model. Um, you can use it to estimate impacts of policy changes, as I said before. 
So if, uh, if there's a policy change being considered within a state, you might want to estimate what the impact of that is going to be on your population in your prison or corrections budget, something like that. Um, it can inform budget resources um, and allocations. So for example, if you're forecasting that your prison population is going to grow significantly over the next five years, um, a state might want to keep that, in, can keep that in mind and find ways to uh, simultaneously grow their corrections budget or find policies that they can implement to reduce the prison population so it doesn't exert uh, that kind of influence on their, on their budget. Um, and then finally, it can guide legislation. So in many states now, um, they use forecasting models. Anytime a legislation is proposed, they'll do an estimate on how it's going to affect the prison population to see what kind of fiscal impacts there are. Um, many states now are also even doing racial disparity analyses. So if there's a, if there's a, a le piece of legislation that's been proposed, they'll see what kind of impact it's going to have on the racial and ethnic makeup of their prison population to see if it's going to have disparate impacts. Um, I also want to just talk a little bit about some of the existing forecasting tools and methods that are out there. Um, so the underlying methods used in many of the existing tools are range. Um, I'm just providing you a snippet of what those are, um, but just note that they're, that they're various. Um, so many of these tools use simple linear regression. Um, most of them, I would say, use some sort of a REMA or time series model, which if you're not familiar, it's simply a model that looks at time trends in past periods, so either in previous quarters, months, or years, something like that, and estimates future trends based on how those past trends are. Um, that's how a lot of these tools work. Um, there's also a method called exponential smoothing, which takes sort of a weighted average of past observations um, and uses that to project the future. Um, so these are the methods that are used in many of these statistical programs. Um, so I just wanted to highlight here, too, that most statistical programs, and I'm sure these are what many of you on the phone use, um, like Excel, SPSS, Data, SAS, R, Python, and, and so on, most of these programs have built-in forecasting tools available to you. Um, so, for example, it's, they're, called, they're typically called a forecast package, or um, some of them have user-created packages that you can upload and use in the program. Um, but there, there's many tools already available to you. Um, so I would encourage, if you're, if you're interested in doing your own forecast, for a prison population or some other type of data, um, and you're comfortable with one of these programs, I would just start there. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is how Lizzie and I kind of created our own approach and our own method for, for forecasting. Um, but if you just want to get your feet wet into forecasting or, or start it out, I would just stick with what you're comfortable with um, and, st and start there. Um, so I'm not going to get into detail about how to do it in each one of these programs. I know how to do it in some of these programs, but um, if you're interested in learning more about it, I would simply just go online. For example, you can Google forecasting SPSS, and you can get tons of resources um, freely available to you. There's uh, instructional videos and, uh, and other things. Um, so if you're interested in moving forward in a, in a very simple way, that's one approach. And then I finally just wanted to highlight that many states already have their own kind of forecasting models or tools that they use, um, and these really vary. They're sort of a black box. Um, if, you, if you go and you try to look at how they do the forecasting, they're not very clear about what methods they're using. Um, and so again, I'm, I'm just highlighting here that uh, unlike other types of statistical analyses, there's really not best practices or standards that I'm aware of, at least, out there for how to do forecasting for prison populations. There's many, many ways to come at it, and I think you really need to tailor your approach to your uses, uh, your goals, and the data that you have available to you. Okay, so that was my kind of quick background um, on forecasting. What I want to spend the next um, few minutes or so talking about is how to develop your own forecast. Um, so I want to emphasize here that I'm going to go, since you know this is a relatively short uh, webinar presentation, I'm only going to provide kind of a high-level overview of the types of considerations and inputs and outputs you need when developing a forecast. And then we've simplified what we're calling a three-step approach to creating a forecast. But this is very high level. Um, so if you're interested in knowing the details about how to do it, you feel free to ask us questions at the end. Um, and I'm also going to mention a few resources, which are up here on the screen right now. Um, if you want to dig into it a little bit more. Um, so as I said in the beginning, um, we're going to be talking about a tool that we've created at the Urban Institute called the Prison Population Forecaster. This is an interactive tool um, that, uh, that encourages users to go in and create forecasts um, within states uh, for, to see how 
state prison populations might change based on proposed policies. Um, it also estimates um, the impacts on uh, costs or correctional budgets as well as uh, racial disparities or what, how we define it, the racial and ethnic makeup of the prison population. Um, so the link to access the Urban Institute tool is posted right there on the screen. Um, that's a shortened link. And if you go into that tool, so if you click on that link, what you'll see is immediately you'll see the interactive tool available to you. Um, and Lizzie is going to walk you through that tool at the end of the presentation so you know how to use it. Um, it's, it's relatively intuitive, but we're going to highlight kind of how it works and what it shows um, at the end of this presentation. But if you click on that link, not only do you see the tool, you can um, access our full, very detailed methodology of how we created uh, the Prison Population Forecaster, as well as a link to a GitHub account where you can download the code for yourself. I believe it's in, it's in R. Um, so you can download that code and you can adapt it for your own purposes if you'd like. Um, so we try to be as transparent as possible. Again, um, this is sort of our journey and what we came up with. Um, I'm not saying that this is the best approach or the only approach by any means, um, but if you want to see how we did this, you can look at our very detailed methodology. We include in there step-by-step -step instructions as to how we did it, all the equations that we included in our model, and then again, you can download the code um, from GitHub and, and look at it for yourself. Okay, so when you're developing a forecast, these are some of the key considerations um, that you need to have upfront before you start developing your model. Uh, so first, you need to identify your aims and the uses of your forecast. So as I said before, um, it's really important to know what you wanna do with your, with your forecast before you start to create your model. Um, so for example, if one of the, your key goals of your forecast is to be able to see how a very specific um, proposed piece of legislation will impact the prison population, you wanna make sure that you can identify the group, um, the subgroup in your prison population that's being affected by the legislation. So if that sounded confusing, um, for example, if a piece of legislation is gonna affect um, people convicted of drug offenses who have you know, uh, 200 grams or more of some drug, right? Some, some very specific uh, piece of legislation, which is how most legislation is crafted, you're gonna to need to be able to identify that group in your data if you wanna model that precisely. And if you can't identify that group specifically, you're gonna to need to come up with some other way to estimate that, right? So knowing um, how you plan on using the forecast is critical as you're starting to gather data and structure your data. So that's the next consideration is your data sources and the structure of your data. And then finally related to all that is understanding what kinds of subgroups you're gonna to need to have in that data um, for your analysis. So as I said before, if there's specific offense categories that you wanna be modeling, you need to make sure that's available in your data. If you're looking at how um, uh, forecasts will change for people coming into prison on new crimes versus revocations, um, i.e. admission type, you wanna make sure you account for that in your data. Um, so those are all considerations to have up front before you even start developing your model. So once you've thought through all of that, you can select an existing method or kind of one of these plug and play options that I highlighted earlier. You can put numbers into Excel and use their forecasting package. You can do it in SPSS or Stata or SAS or whatever else you're familiar with and just you know, tinker with uh, the options that they have available in those packages or you can develop your own approach, um, which is what we wound up doing because it uh, made more sense for the data that we had available to us. Um, so I'm gonna now talk about if you decide to develop your own approach, here's one way to do it. Um, so I'm gonna talk first about the inputs that go into a forecasting model, and then I'm gonna give a, a very quick kind of three-step approach to creating a forecast. And that, that three-step approach is based on these inputs, which is why I'm gonna talk about those first. Um, so the inputs that go into a forecasting model include stock population, admissions to prison, and then length of stay or time served. So in other words, um, who's in prison, who's coming into prison, and how long will they all stay, right? Those are the primary drivers of a prison population. Um, and within each of these, so in other words, if you're thinking about it, so if you're trying to forecast 10 years into the future, the only thing you really need to know to forecast 10 years into the future for a prison population is who's in prison right now, how many more people do we expect to come into prison over these next 10 years, and of those people who are in prison now and come into prison over the next 10 years, how long will they stay in prison? In other words, how many of them will be released after serving their time, right? And if you can estimate that, you'll know what the prison population should be 10 years from now. I know that sounds very basic and obvious, um, but 
we broke it down into these inputs because we realized that if we can uh, estimate each of these factors separately, we can put them in a model together and come up with a forecast. Um, so again, uh, these are the drivers of the prison population as well as costs and other outcomes. Um, these can all be disaggregated into relevant categories. So for example, um, if, you're look, if you wanna look at property offenses versus violent offenses, you'd wanna make sure you're looking at admissions to prison and length of stay for those types of offense categories separately because that's important. Um, and also if you're trying to manipulate your forecast to model the impact of some sort of policy change or statutory change, um, then th these are the inputs that you would focus on. So for example, if, uh, if you're trying to in, uh, estimate the impact of a policy that would reduce admissions to prison for uh, theft, then you would um, simply in your forecast, you would manipulate that category, admissions to prison for theft, and you would see how that impacts your overall prison population. Um, so now I'm gonna walk through each of these inputs one by one, just to put a finer point on it. Um, so the first input is the stock population. I think we all know this, but the stock population is the number of people in prison on any given date. It's typically measured at the end of a calendar year or fiscal year. Um, and what's important to realize is this is really what you're forecasting. So when you're forecasting 10 years out in the future, you wanna know what the stock population is gonna be 10 years from now. Um, and really the stock population in any given year is simply comprised of the stock population from the previous year, minus the people released during the previous year, plus the people admitted during the previous year. Again, I know that's very basic and obvious, um, but when you start to break it down to these components, it makes the process of forecasting more straightforward. Um, so now talking about admissions to prison specifically, um, again, you wanna know in your forecast, you wanna know how many people you expect to be coming into prison over X number of years. So whatever your forecasting period is. So for example, if you're trying to forecast 10 years out, you wanna know how many people are gonna be admitted to prison over the next 10 years. Um, and that can be affected by a number of different things, right? So um, if you expect the alternative sentencing to change over the next 10 years, you'd wanna factor that into it. So for example, if more people are gonna be sentenced to probation instead of prison, and you expect that to change, that would have to be factored into your forecast. Um, if you expect there to be a change in felony thresholds or the people that are um, being convicted of felonies and thus eligible for prison sentences, you'd wanna factor that into it. Um, you, uh, if there's crime prevention efforts in your state, for example, um, you know, and you expect there to be fewer crimes committed over the next 10 years, that can affect admissions to prison. And then also interesting, um, statewide population and demographic changes, right? Um, so as, as states and the nation as a whole continues to age, um, we have older populations now than we did 10 years ago, and we expect those trends to continue, then we're having fewer and fewer people um, in our states that, have, uh, that are in their kind of crime or prime crimi criminal propensity years or uh, crime uh, years, right? So as we know, people tend to age out of crime. And so if populations are getting older, on, on the whole, then we'd expect fewer people to be coming into prison because there's fewer people committing crimes. Um, so that's all the kind of things you'd wanna consider when you're estimating admissions to prison. Um, and then finally, when we're talking about length of stay or time served, again, um, this is key because we wanna know of the people who are in prison and the people coming into prison over the forecast period, again, we'll say 10 years. So over the next 10 years of all the people who are in prison during that 10 year period, how long do we expect them to stay in prison? Um, and that determines how many people are released and again, determines your overall prison population. And things that can affect um, time served obviously are gonna be sentence lengths. Um, clearly the longer you're sentenced for, the longer you're likely gonna spend in prison. If your state has mandatory minimum policies, so for example, if people are mandated to spend at least 80% of their sentence in prison, that's gonna affect time served. And if you think that's gonna change, during your forecast period, that's something you'd need to account for. Um, if it's an indeterminate versus determinate sentencing model, that's important. And then of course, um, if your state has early release policies, so for example, um, people who are in prison, if they don't misbehave, they can get out on good behavior earlier than their sentence calls for, um, and you expect that to change or you know increase or decrease during your forecast period, those are all things that you'd wanna account for in your model or that you could account for in your model. Okay, 
Um, so I went kind of quickly over the inputs. Um, what I want to do now is just, we, we've come up with a very simplified three-step approach to creating kind of a forecast. Um, this is derived from our more uh, detailed methodology that I, that I mentioned earlier. So if you go to the, um, the link that I provided earlier and look at the PPF for the present population forecaster online, you can download our much more detailed methodology, which walks you through this again in, in much more details. Um, but I'm trying to simplify it here because I think that these three steps are kind of the general approach you would need to take in order to create um, a forecasting model. Um, so step one is pretty obvious. You need to obtain and then process your data. So you might get individual level data or aggregate data, or um, that would depend on the data sources that are available to you and how you want to use it. Um, again, depending on how you want to use the forecast or how you intend for people to use it, that would determine how you kind of process the data. So as I mentioned earlier, you might want to make sure that you're um, pulling out certain offense categories or admission categories um, to be able to model that um, in your forecast. So to give an example of this with the PPF, um, we use the NCRP data, um, which is, if you're not familiar, it's a National Corrections Reporting Program, and it collects uh, corrections data from most of the states in the US. Um, it's individual term record data, um, so it's a very large data set. And what we were able to do is we pulled out data uh, that was clean enough for us to use from 46 jurisdictions, that was 45 states and DC. Um, and then we aggregated that data um, uh, to 18 standardized offense categories. So in other words, we took uh, this individual data and we aggregated it. So we had the counts of admissions um, and the stock population and releases across these, 45, these 46 jurisdictions, and it was um, based on these 18 standardized offense categories. Now there's some problems with using standardized offense categories, but that's for another webinar. <laughs> um, so, um, but what this allowed us to do is we can compare forecasts in California, for example, to forecasts in New York, um, and we can compare what a change in one offense category in one state would result in the same change in another state approximately because we're using kind of standard standard categories. Um, so once you have the data, so you, again, you need to look at what data you have available to you in your state and figure out um, how you want to use it and how you want to process it. And then the next step, the most important step, creating your baseline estimate. Um, so we're kind of making up terms here because again, I don't think that there's standard terms that are used. So we're calling this part the, the baseline estimate. Step three is going to be the forecast estimate. So I just don't want to confuse those two. So the baseline estimate, as we are calling it, um, is where you expect your present population to be, let's say in 10 years and however many years you're forecasting, where you expect the population to be in 10 years based on current trends. So in other words, if nothing changes, if everything stays the same, um, what will your population be 10 years from now? That's what we're calling the baseline estimate. Um, so this could be based on past trends, right? Um, you can look at uh, how things have been over the past 10 years and then assume that that will continue for the next 10 years. Um, it can be more informed by changes that you know are currently happening. So for example, if your state just passed a new law that decriminalized some type of crime and you know that admissions are gonna change, um, or that crime, you'd want to account for that in your model. But basically you're saying, whatever the state of our, um, our criminal justice process is right now in our state, we, we want to see what that's going to look like 10 years from now and how that's going to affect our prison population. Um, so the way we did this in the PPF, and I'm going to try to uh, keep this as simple and straightforward as possible, but as I've said a few times, if you want more details on specifically what I mean here, please check out our uh, methodology report. Um, but in the PPF, what we did is we wanted to project, we wanted to create a 10 year forecast for those 46 jurisdictions that I mentioned earlier. Um, and the way we did that is we looked at the weighted five year average um, for admissions and length of stay. Um, in those states, we used the five year average for a number of reasons, which I'm not going to get into right, right now on the phone, but we looked at doing it different ways and wound up selecting a five year average. Um, we then weighted that five year average. So we gave more weight to more recent years of data because we thought that that had a greater impact on what was happening than what happened five years ago. 
Um, and so we calculated what admissions have looked like over the past five years, and then we extended that out for 10 years. And we, we said, if these trends continue over the next 10 years, here's how many admissions we expect there to be into prison for the next 10 years. And we did that year by year. And then we did the same thing for length of stay. Um, our method for calculating length of stay is a little complicated, so um, I'm just going to point you to the report rather than going into detail about it here right now. Um, but it was difficult because we had to cal we had to come up with a method that we could use across 46 very unique jurisdictions, and that was challenging. Um, so again, I would just say check out our report if you want more information on that. Um, so we did that. We calculated these five-year averages for length of stay and admissions. We um, then converted length of stay into an estimate that calculated the share of people expected to remain in prison for more than one year. So in other words, it, it became a percentage. So um, again, you can see exactly how we did that in our report. But let's just say, for example, that we have 1,000 people in prison right now um, for uh, homicide. We calculate, we turn length of stay into this percent number that's listed on the screen by uh, uh, depicted with the p-value that I have up on there. And let's say that that p-value was 0.9, that we would say of the 1,000 people in prison right now for homicide, we expect 90% of them to stay in prison over the next year, while 10% of them would be released in that year. And using that method, um, we calculated stock populations for each year over a 10-year period using that equation that's in pink right there on the screen. Um, so for the stock population in one year, again, it's comprised of the stock population from the previous year times that p-value plus the number of admissions in that year. So in other words, just to give you an example, if we were trying to calculate the population for 2021, um, one year from now, we would look at the stock population now, multiply that stock population by the percent of people we expect to be remaining in prison for at least a year, and then we add, um, which is kind of an estimate of releases, and then we add to that the number of admissions that we expect to take place over the next year, right? And that gives us what we expect our population to be one year from now. Um, so that was our approach. Um, that's, that's what we call, again, the baseline estimate. So we did that each year for 10 years, and at the end of that 10 years, we have our baseline estimate um, or our, for our forecast period. And then the final step is what we're calling our forecast estimate, and this is uh, the baseline estimate in step two is what we expect the prison population to be in 10 years based on current trends. The forecast estimate is what we expect the population to be if something changes, right? And so this is because we designed our tool to be interactive, um, users can actually go in and make those changes themselves and then see how that changes the forecast estimate. So again, um, Lizzie is going to show you that in a few slides. Um, she's going to walk, kind of walk you through what the PPF looks like, but that's that's how we did it. Um, so we have a baseline estimate, and the forecast estimate is directly tied in to that baseline estimate. So we do the same thing for the forecast estimate, but then we either manipulate length of stay or admissions to prison based on whatever it is you're trying to model. So for example, if you're modeling, um, if your state is considering something that would reduce length of stay for burglary by 15%, you can go into the PPF and you can change um, using the slider that we have available, you can reduce length of stay for burglaries by 15%. Um, and that will show you, it will spit out a forecast estimate and show you how that compares to the baseline estimate, right? Um, at the end of the day, every policy change that's being considered that's going to impact the prison population is either going to be affecting admissions to prisons or length of stay for people in prison, right? That's at, as we talked about earlier. Um, so again, in the PPF, we have this slider that allows you to model up to 100% increase or decrease in either length of stay or admissions for the 18 categories of offenses that I mentioned earlier. So it's, um, it's you know, pretty detailed in what you can do and how you can um, model things um, across these 46 different jurisdictions. Okay, um, as I said before, th so that's our three-step approach. Um, I've said this a few times, This I meant this to be as straightforward and as high level as I could fit into this webinar. If there's uh, detailed questions or specific questions, we're happy to answer them at the end. Um, but I would also encourage you to, to look at the tool itself and to look at our report, um, and the, the methodology, and that should give you hopefully some more information that you can use for yourselves. Um, so what I want to talk about too, um, before I turn it over to Lizzie, is 
um, when you when you've already taken the time to estimate uh, the prison population, to estimate the impact on the prison population, you're already as you can you can from that extrapolate how that change is going to impact costs and other and other outcomes. Um, so we've done that in the prison population forecaster, as Lizzie will show you when you when you create your forecast estimate, and not only shows you how that's going to affect the prison population as a whole, so whether it's going to increase or decrease the prison population, it also shows you what kind of impact that's going to have on the budget or um, the cost of corrections in that state. Um, without getting into too much detail right here on the phone, um, it's important to know that if you're doing that in your state, you do have to account for the differences between marginal and operating costs. As many of you probably know, um, marginal costs are the direct costs associated with incarcerating someone each day. So that is their food, healthcare, clothing, um, whereas operating costs are things that don't change as much, and that is staff salaries, utilities for correctional facilities, construction costs, et cetera. Um, and so in our tool, what we've tried to do is we uh, created what we're calling the sliding scale marginal cost multiplier. We were just trying to think of a very impressive name, and so that's how we came up with that. Um, but essentially what it does is it, in, in the tool, the greater the impact on the prison population, the greater the impact is on cost. In other words, so if you're reducing the prison population by 5%, the impact per person might be only a few thousand dollars because you're only going to be reducing the clothing for that person, their medical costs, and food. But if you can actually reduce your prison population by, let's say, 50%, the impact of that 50% is much greater because not only are you now getting rid of the food, co uh, food, clothing, and medical costs of those people, you're also probably talking about um, either laying off staff or not hiring new staff, so your staff costs are going to go down. You might even shut down a prison or a wing of a prison, so your operating costs are going to go down. And so we've tried to calculate uh, or account for that in our in our method. Um, and then lastly, I'll just say we also um, looked at how changes in prison populations also affect the demographic makeup of that prison. Um, again, racial disparities are something obviously that a lot of us are thinking about in our research. And so we try to come up with a method for estimating that. Um, we came up with a very straightforward approach, which is basically looking at the makeup of the prison population within each offense category with the data that's currently available or the most recent available data. So let's say if we did it now, we would look at what the makeup is within each offense category in 2020. And then we apply that same makeup to the population in 2030, if we're doing a 10 year forecast. Um, and so we can see how um, disparities might go up or down based on how we're forecasting the present population. Okay, so that's it from me. Again, the last thing I'll say I'll do one more time is um, we try to keep this as straightforward as possible. Please check out, um, if you are if you really want to learn more about how we did this, please look at the, uh, um, the methodology that we have online. Um, so, uh, finally, with the prison population forecaster, uh, we try to come up with a very interactive tool. Um, but you should also consider when you're doing um, when you're doing forecasting, uh, what how you want to disseminate that information. So if you want it to be just in a report where you summarize your findings, if you want to include some static visualizations um, like line charts that show what the baseline estimate is versus a simulated or forecasted estimate on you know showing some sort of policy change. Um, so what we're going to show you today is what an interactive tool can look like. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to my colleague. Great. Thanks, Bryce. <clears throat> so um, uh, I'm Lizzie Pelletier, as Bryce said, and I'm just going to talk through um, how to use the forecasting tool that we've created, which is the Prison Population Forecaster, uh, the PPF. And um, so as Bryce mentioned, this is an online interactive web tool that's hosted on um, urban.org, the Urban Institute's website. Um, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of the uh, lay of the land of the interface and walk through um, how to create and save and then export um, your own forecast using the tool. So um, this is a screenshot of the PPF landing page. Um, it defaults to uh, one forecasted scenario, as you can see, which is um, a 20% reduction in admissions and length of stay uh, for all offenses. 
and uh, it also defaults to a state, which is Alabama. Um, so on the left bar is uh, where you select uh, which state you're interested in and then which changes to admissions and length of stay you're interested in projecting the impact of. Um, the center of the screen is a graph um, of the prison population, both historically and then under the uh, baseline and forecasted scenarios. So the black solid line on the left represents the historical population that we have um, years of available data for. Uh, the um, black dashed line on the right is our prediction of the baseline estimate, the kind of business as usual estimate uh, that Bryce mentioned. Um, based on recent trends in the data. And then the pink line is, um, represents a forecaster estimate of uh, the prison population under the impact of the changes to admissions of length and length of stay that you've uh, specified. And then on the right, you can see kind of a summary of what you've chosen in terms of the state, uh, the changes, um, and then uh, a way to save the forecast. So I'm just going to walk through kind of the process of uh, generating a, an example forecast. So the first step is to select a state. So um, we've selected Alabama, as you can see, uh, with that yellow arrow on the left. Uh, <clears throat> the next step is then to select the changes that you want to forecast for each offense category um, by expanding the menus under each of those categories in the left sidebar. So uh, here you can see that we're forecasting a 6% increase in admissions for all violent offenses um, and a 30% reduction in length of prison terms for those same offenses. So maybe we're interested in forecasting the combined effect of a slight increase in sentencing to prison for these offenses for whatever um, reason changes to policy or practice combined with uh, maybe a new parole policy that allows people to be released earlier, which could lead to the, uh, the length of stay change. And a note that you can also make changes to more specific offense categories by expanding those menus down below. Uh, you can see um, assault, homicide, kidnapping, et cetera, listed down there. And um, the other offense categories can be expanded as well. Then once you've made those changes, the graph will automatically update. So you can see the pink line um, has changed to reflect what we've done there. And a note that you can click this blue arrow that says show demographics and costs down at the bottom. And then that'll show um, a new set of results, um, basically summarizing the population impact, uh, listing the cost estimate, um, and uh, also a bar graph reflecting our projected changes to the racial and ethnic makeup of the prison population. So that bar graph compares uh, the racial and ethnic breakdown of the population in gray under our estimated baseline scenario to um, the forecasted uh, population in pink with the admissions and length of stay changes that we've applied. Um, and then finally, you can click on Save My Forecast, uh, which will sort of lock in that forecast that you've selected so that it's saved on the graph and it'll be sort of frozen on the graph. Um, that forecast will then appear under the Saved Forecast section in the bottom right. Um, and then you can repeat steps one through four uh, to generate and save multiple forecasts, kind of comparing the effect of different scenarios that you're interested in. Um, those will all appear as multiple lines on the graph, and then you can hover over each line, uh, click on the line, and then see more details about that specific forecast. Then all of your um, different forecasts will be saved under the Save Forecast section on the bottom right, as you can see. Um, and then you can click on the print icon, um, that little printer picture on the bottom right, um, which will uh, export your results into a format that can either be printed or saved to a PDF um, so that you have a copy of your results. And those are all the slides we have, so happy to take questions, which I think Mark will be facilitating. Well, thank you, uh, Bryce and Elizabeth. Uh, 
That was an excellent presentation. I see we have a little time for questions. Um, questions for Bryce and Elizabeth can be entered in the chat box. And please select host presenter panelist to make it easy for us to see the questions. Uh, as we move into the Q&A portion of this webinar, we're going to open a poll to get your reactions to today's program. Please take a minute to provide feedback before signing off. Uh, your input helps us fulfill our reporting requirement. So I will uh, hold off for a second and uh, see if we uh, get any questions from anyone. Okay, uh, we have a question. Uh, this one is from uh, Kelly Officer. And she mentioned that uh, folks in Oregon are paying a lot of attention uh, to this. And and both the report for Oregon and the interactive tool. So this is a comment uh, rather than a question. Uh, here's a question uh, from Joel Boche. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I imagine you guys reviewed forecasting policies for individual state governments. How often do states tend to complete fiscal impacts to look at savings projections as well as costs? Um, I, can start with, I can answer then, Lizzie, feel free to jump in if you'd like. Um, so we did look at we did look at state governments. Um, we, I wouldn't say we did a, a exhaustive scan of practice, but we did look at as many states as we could easily find. Uh, we actually did that for two reasons. This wasn't the question, but I'll just say this for a second. We actually compared the forecast the forecasts that we came up with in our model to state forecasts that they did themselves, and found that we were pretty close in most cases to what those states projected. So we were happy about that. Um, and in terms of your question, how often do states tend to complete fiscal impacts to look at savings projections as well as costs? Um, I would say that they do it pretty often. The way they do it, though, is a little unclear. Um, so like I said, we try to be very thoughtful about estimating marginal impacts versus operate, um, or marginal costs versus operating costs. Um, many states, as you'll see, um, when people talk about the cost of prison, They'll just simply take a total corrections budget, divide it by the, the total population um, or inmate population, and then they talk about the per inmate cost as being that. So, so we always hear something like, you know, forty thousand, fifty thousand, or sixty thousand um, dollars per person. And so, oftentimes they're using that number to talk about impacts, and that's not accurate in practice because simply removing ten people from a prison population is not going to lead to a, you know. 40,000 times 10 times 10 savings because there's those really you have to realize pretty large uh, reductions in your population before you start to see reductions in your overall operating costs. Um, so I would say that they do it often, but it's not always clear what methods they're using to estimate costs or savings. Okay, we have another question. This is from Jonathan Kodalak. Uh, and Jonathan is from Saskatchewan, Canada and says that he's working on building a forecaster similar to the one you presented. He wants to know how long would you say it took to develop? Um, I'm happy to answer, or, or Lizzie, do you wanna, wanna answer? Um, yeah, you should go ahead, I think. Okay, um, so Lizzie and I did this one together, and we went through many iterations first, so it took us, I would say, several months, not not devoting 100% of our time to it, but um, as we work on multiple projects at our organization. But, you know, I would say it took us several months to come up with an approach that worked. And then um, I didn't mention this in the beginning, but uh, this is actually the current interactive tool that we linked to is the second iteration of the PPF. We had one that came out a couple of years prior that was much more simple in how it could be used and it only had a few states in there, not 45. Um, and so I would plan for several months because you because not only do you have to come up with the approach and the methods, but then you really want to work out as many bugs as you can in advance to make sure that you're not creating that there's not estimating impossible scenarios. Like so, for example, um, and we talk about this in our methodology too. But we had done something 
that at one point started to estimate negative admissions to prison, um, which is a problem because obviously you can't have negative people in prison, but computationally it would just it, it was affecting our model in a, in a really weird way. So I think you want to plan for a good period of time to, to create these models. Okay. Yeah, I think just taking the time at the on the front end to really understand, um, I'm sure you know, but the data inputs and the different offense categories and just um, developing a really solid understanding of the, the data inputs before beginning is really important too, I think, which can extend the amount of time that it takes. <laughs> Good. Uh, we're back to uh, Kelly Officer. Uh, she does have a question about uh, whether, uh, Bryce and Lizzie, whether you're planning any updates or what are the next steps for the project? We uh, are not planning any updates at this point, but we have created the model in such a way that it can be easily updated. Um, so the plan is to update it at some point, but we don't have anything currently underway. Um, but we've created it in such a way that um, we can really just get the newest iteration of NCRP data load that back into the code that we've already created and it and it should update of course we have to do some quality checking and other things but um, we've we, we've tried to make it in such a way that we can do updates in the future um one question came in uh from someone who uh, got to the presentation 10 minutes late uh, because of a meeting and asking if the full presentation will be available online i can answer that one the the answer is yes uh, I don't know how long it will take uh, the technicians at JRSA to get that posted, but that usually does take place fairly quickly. Uh, the next question uh, from George Brown, uh, he's asking, do you have any recommendations for how to find out what forecast softwares or pro other programs other states are using? The Kansas Sentencing Commission has been using the same program for quite some time and are interested in knowing what others are using. Um, my only recommendation would be to reach out to them directly. Um, like I, 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 was, I, I said this, but very quickly in the beginning, um, we tried to look at what other states were doing um, and specifically you know, in the agencies within that state that do the forecasting and, and that varies by state what that agency is um, and it's, it really is difficult. I think they're, uh, they're not, I don't want to say they're not being transparent, but I just, they, they're not always posting the information available out there um, that's readily accessible. So I think if you contacted people directly, they'd be willing to share that. Um, we have not tried doing that. So, um, but I'd imagine that that's the best way to get it. Usually if you read the report carefully, it doesn't always say what program they're using or what their specific methods were. Um, so I would, I would say the best way to get it is just to contact them directly. Okay, uh, we have uh, an interesting question that just came in uh, asking if PPF, PPF, excuse me, uh, may be used for people serving time in the community. Um, I'm assuming that means people serving time on probation or community, community uh, corrections, I would assume. Yeah, um, it can be the uh, not not the the way that not the tool that we have right now. Um, that tool is, is specific to. Uh, institutional corrections. Um, so when we're talking about these state correctional populations, we're squarely talking about people in, in state prison systems, um, but it could be modified in a, uh, uh, with the same methods, I think, or very similar methods to look at community corrections. I don't see any reason why that wouldn't be the case. Yeah, I think uh, the one concern there would just be data quality, data on term records for community corrections tend to be um, of lower quality, uh, not across all states, of course, but um, that would be a consideration. Okay. Yeah, to clarify my point, I don't know if we could do it. <laughs> I don't know if there's a good enough data source out there for us to be able to do this across as many states as we have in the PPF, but I think if a, if a particular state wants to do it or someone wants to do it for a few states, as Lizzie said, if you can get the data for it, I think you could take the same general approach and make it work. For sure. Great. Okay, uh, those are the questions that have been submitted. Uh, as you can see, the contact information for Bryce and Lizzie are up on your screen. I'm sure they'd be happy to address any other questions you have. Uh, you can certainly email them.
I just want to remind you to complete the poll. And aside from that, I want to thank everybody for participating in this. And I want to especially thank Bryce and Elizabeth for a very informative presentation. Uh, with that in mind, uh, if you're done with the poll, you can uh, click out of the program uh, whenever you'd like.